My name is Zenon Marinakis. Um, I'm with DSA Architects in Johannesburg, um, and we I represent the Africa arm of um, DSA Architects International. Um, today we are addressing the rise of the metropolitan mixed use development, and um, and in the context, and particularly in Africa. Um, and when we look at a metropolis, we we think about a mixed use development, but. It, it, it's not as per the traditional mixed use development, which is your traditional high street, etc. Um, the ones we look at of, are of a metropolitan nature, which involve a significant conglomeration of economic, political, and cultural facilities, which pull it together with a common cause. And we'll go through the various aspects that do pull that together. And um, in terms of that, we are fortunate that we've got a quite a diverse panel, which are all involved in most of the key disciplines that would initiate, nurture, and deliver a mixed-use development. You know, on the development side, we have Paul on Wannabe, who is um, the chief executive of Landmark Group Nigeria, um, who is very active in a number of African countries and has got um, a fair amount of European experience. We got um, Simon Odenser. He's representing JLL, James Lang LaSalle. He's head of the strategic consulting for Africa. We've got Tim White, who's the CEO of Profika, Pan-African Development and Project Management Company, also very active. And we have Marco Magnamo, who's um, the executive senior associate and jo joint head of sustainability for Bentley Associates in Johannesburg. All right, I'd like to um, kick off with Paul. Paul, when we look at a mixed-use development, as a developer, what are the key factors? We all know that you've got an anchor and then the, the catalyst for pulling it together. On your side, what would you define as the key elements that bring the components together? Thank you, Philip. Hello? Thank you, Philip. I suppose um, there are many different definitions and many people see mixed use and developments in different ways. Uh, well, since we're talking about sort of metropolitan cities and, and the creation of a mixed use development rather than the involvement of one, um, maybe if you'll excuse me, I'll use sort of our landmark as an example if you like, as a case study. Um, so what we set out to do was to achieve the live, the work, the play, and the shop all on one site. And as you said, you, you need a catalyst and you need an anchor. For us, our, our anchor was the waterfront, and our catalyst was our convention center, and, it, and it, it grew from there. I suppose there are four, there are four issues um, that lead, led us to sort of create sort of different mixed-use developments. And the first was the economic logic, obviously, just having multiple revenue streams that you never get hit all at the same time. The second, in, especially in parts of Africa where we're, we're building, um, security. Just made, being able to have a front door and a back door. Um, the third is sort of consolidation of infrastructure due to infrastructure shortages. And um, the fourth is literally just lifestyle and the way, the aspirational way that people are growing to for convenience, basically. Um, so that, in, in my mind, is, is are the key things that sort of encapsulate uh, and makes you flow. Simon, on your side, you, you, you are at the inception on, on the feasibility side when, you know, the spark gets into someone like Paul's eye. What, what is your take and what are the components that you think are key in making it successful? Yeah, as you pointed out, I think the, the most important um, component of mixed use is to have uh, your catalyst. You need to get that right because you want to establish your development as a destination. You need to have a full factor to your development, uh, create your own catchment area if you don't have uh, one existing. So this is probably the most important factor to get right from the very beginning. If you want, if you want to get um, the, the whole scheme right uh, later on in the, the further phases, and this ties to uh, what Paul was saying in terms of uh, economic rational. Uh, so if you if you want to establish a large mixed uh, use scheme, you need to figure out a way to phase your project so that uh, your initial phase is actually generating enough cash flows uh, to finance the later phases. So uh, I will come back to the catalyst thing that's really uh, the most important part, as well as the first element that you will build around, around that uh, catalyst uh, to, uh, to generate uh, uh, positive cash flows in, in, in the first phase. 
It's interesting that you mentioned the, 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 the one function sort of supplementing or complementing the others. And that's something that, that I'd like to touch on with Tim later. But before we get onto that, on, on when a development is conceived, you know, we've just been found that we, when we get involved in it, the client is usually in two minds between what you do first, the feasibility or the design, or does the one work in hand with the other. Marco, on your side, um, on the design side, how do you see it developing? I think uh, any design as a, as a process is fundamentally based on good research, uh, understanding the market um, opportunities, understanding the constraints of the development of the precinct. Uh, because when we approach a design, we want to make sure that every line we put on the page, every decision we take in terms of a, uh, the scale of a, of a particular intervention is done appropriately. And uh, that is based on the team effort. So should one inform the other? Absolutely. We need to make sure that the, the design is, is representative of the context for which, it's, for which it's supposed to sit. So I think many people are going to be walking into this room wondering if there's a particular formula that works with mixed use development. Is it, can it be found that one particular function is always a good approach to put them in place first as opposed to another? And the answer is the formula is exactly what we've been talking about. The formula is getting the homework done right. In the beginning of the design, then needs to work upon that to develop it further. Because a catalyst is only as good as the designer supports it. And if, a, if a, a good idea is not grounded well and a good design in terms of the way that the end user is going to experience that particular function, then it's um, really going to be very difficult to get it off the ground as opposed to if the correct interventions were done and the correct decisions were done in support of market research. So when, when all this gets done and, and you've got to actually get it off the ground and, and put the whole thing together, what are the key factors that impact on your program and keep that critical path going? So as you know, that, that process starts way before we actually get to that point. And, and, uh, and that's why just adding to the upfront planning stage, you need to set the project up for success. So mixed use development, as we know, has different sectors, different uses, and experienced mixed use developers will understand how to actually put that together in terms of the management of those different uses. Uh, the, the parking requirements for retail uh, during the day versus uh, accommodation in hotels and, and uh, apartments at night. Those type of things all need to be put together and the design and planning process needs to be thoroughly thought through, obviously before we get to that stage. So, and, and to also look at the exit strategy in terms of how you are going to exit if you're a developer or how are you going to manage the property if you're a long-term uh, property fund or holder. So those are the critical aspects. To tie that into construction and delivery, the biggest challenge on mixed use, and let's take an example, you've got a shopping center on the ground floor, you have a, a six or eight story hotel, and you have some apartments and possibly an office building. Now, from a planning point of view, you may be able to finish the retail in 12 months, but you're, you know, you're not gonna be able to occupy and actually trade the retail until you finish the development. And it's really understanding those components that are quite critical because you may be able to trade while there's some construction taking place within a shell, and the shell is up and there's work taking in internally, and there's no night time, but if you want to trade first and you want to get your hotel up and running, you can't be building an office building next door to that. Um, we, know, we know that it is a fine line to balance, especially when you manage it, Paul. Now, when it comes, and, and Tim touched on the fact that, you know, you got to recirculate your parking. That's why conference areas and residential works quite well, you know, because then you can double bank your, your parking, and, and it does take the, the edge of that critical element of it. But in terms of managing a mixed-use facility, what are, we all know what the advantages are. What are the disadvantages, and what are the key elements that you always find you've got to pay particular attention to? Well, I suppose what comes to mind initially is the disadvantage of just the different uses and making sure the circulation of those different uses um, res they respect each other. Um, so that, that's obviously one. Also the sort of night and day. So we come from environments where there are infrastructure challenges and power challenges. Um, so the different sort of power needs during the daytime and nighttime and afternoon, uh, managing that as well in the mixed use development um, sometimes could be a bit more expensive um, than you would like. And security challenges as well. And most people want to sort of live, work, or play in a secure environment. But by the very nature of mixed use, it has sort of open doors, if you like, to people outside the prison um, that come in. So managing that um, is a bit of a challenge. In 
In terms of the long-term challenges, obviously just the maintenance of, maintenance of it, uh, making sure that the asset remains sort of viable, and making sure that when one sector suffers, the other sectors are not suffering. You're still collecting service charging on rent, so you can, you can still maintain the property at the sort of standard and convenience that people are paid for. Of course. Now, um, Simon, in, in setting up the, the global picture and the feasibility, what two questions I have. Do you take some of those considerations and the risk into account? And, and secondly, you know, looking at the African context, what do you find is the most, um, I wouldn't say popular, but the most successful um, components that lead to a good metropolitan mixed-use development? Yeah, so on the security aspect, we saw... Not security, just the basic operations and the other risk elements that could come into it. So this is where it's really important to have also the architects and master planner on board from day one because uh, we will be working together uh, to integrate all the uh, planning aspects into our field study. Um, Tim mentioned the, the planning and the phasing. Uh, you build your retail, your retail is 12 months, and then you have your uh, residential or office, it might be 24 months, you can't operate. So from an economic point of view, you have paid for 12 months to build an asset which won't generate any income. So it's, it's not well planned. So all of this we want to, to know it from the very beginning, and that's, how, that's why we need uh, the, the planners to be alongside us, to inform us on how to strategize all of that. Uh, maybe we need to rethink the, the land use uh, on, our, uh, on our master plan uh, to uh, cope with that, that issue and, and still ensure that the, pro uh, the project is, uh, is feasible. Um, which comes back um, to you, Tim, on, on the handing over and um, the logistic nightmare of actually making sure all your civil um, safety and security aspects are all there. What has been your biggest challenge in, in putting that together? Well, I think, I think the, if I can go back a step and, and talk to different mixed-use developments in different parts of, of the continent. So a mixed-use development in, in Santon is very different to a mixed-use development in Victoria Island in Lagos, as an example. And the nature of the surrounding environment is quite critical to that. So if you take uh, Old Mutual's head office, which we're involved in, office of the Santon Caltrack, it's within a precinct and the greater surroundings, which are themselves a mixed-use precinct. So you have a large shopping centre down the road, you have a hotel across the, across the way. So it's, it's a very different environment that, you, that you're working with, it, with them. Then you go to Lagos and you go to Victoria Island where the, the type of amenities aren't that close. And as, as a businessman doing work in, in Lagos, Paul, as you'll know, very difficult to have four meetings a day there because of the nature of travel and the impact that that has on, on your business. So to be able to have an apartment at a, and, a, and, a, you know, and your offices downstairs and be able to entertain uh, guests in the same environment as the right approach. So the, the nature of that mixed use is obviously dependent on the, on the feasibility and the mix. Um, and you know, we, we worked on a lot of mixed use developments before and they're actually, it's a perfect storm to try and get those feasibilities to work. Because you've got to sign up your retail tenants, you've got to sell apartments, you have to get office tenants and in the normal African environment outside of, uh, outside of SADC, those office tenant, tenants aren't going to sign until they see something coming off the ground. So the challenges around the mixing, the planning, the uh, design, and the actual fundamentals of the development are, are the critical aspects to it. So a big input from, from technical on that, and the development process has to run in parallel with the technical process to make sure that all of those challenges and changes as they go are inputted and taken into consideration as it goes. But to go back to your question, so it's setting up the canvas. In terms of delivery, it's got to be planned way up front. And you know, we've got a, an eight-level basement in true South African style. We've got a lot of parking here. We've got an eight-level basement. And uh, you know, you, you, you're handing over basements in certain aspects and certain areas in time, depending on when your tenants are coming in. Uh, as an example, retail tenants will take a 90-day beneficial occupation period, those sort of things. So you, you're planning that exactly in, in line with all of that. And if you, if you can plan the, the end users and the handover to those end users way up front, then you can plan how you demarcate certain areas to be able to hand over. But as I say, it's all about the trading. You're not going to sell an apartment unless that guy knows when he walks into that apartment, there's not a construction site on his doorstep. 
You, you just touched on, because when we look at mixed-use developments, you, you have a sentence scenario where, you know, not all facilities are incorporated within the same development and they all work together to facilitate um, a, a more um, holistic urban centre. You know, um, Marka, on your side, you know, when you have dedicated um, facilities and when it comes under one roof, under one developer, what do you find the key elements are and the not the disadvantages, but the difficulties are in trying to bring that whole basket together, which might or might not be feasible in terms of your design process? And when it comes to mixed use design, what you find is that people are looking to invest in longevity. They want to know that the decisions they make today are going to still reap the rewards in five years, ten years, however long that particular investor, developer, or client chooses to remain involved in that development. No, but it's also important that at the point where the exit strategy kicks in, they've got a marketable asset that will again reap the rewards in terms of passing along to those that are perhaps looking to take it forward. So designing or catering for or even strategizing for longevity is quite quite a, a difficult task. And I think that comes back to perhaps the principles of sustainable development as well. What you're looking to do is to try and find that perfect balance between user experience uh, and profit. You know, trying to find that perfect balance between the socioeconomic conditions of the area, the environmental constraints, and, um, and of course the, the marketability of the development. So when dealing with a property developer or a client that has one big scheme in mind, You've got to think about, of course, the rollout strategy. How is the phasing going to affect the initial design? And build in criteria for flexibility in design as well. Countless times, in fact, I can't think of one development that has started off with, uh, with its initial design having been followed through and followed through to be actually representing the final de development that's gone, gone into ground. So knowing that you've got a team that is able to cater towards a flexible uh, approach in, in design, changing, shifting, and, uh, and readjusting the, uh, the position and the, the offering to meet growing and changing economic and socio-economic socio constraints of the, of the, the area is uh, fundamental. Um, and uh, no development should be averse to that. Uh, it's, uh, we always look to developments international and uh, internationally thinking about how great the mixed use of environments we've created because they grow organically over time. And we should be averse to representing or integrating that kind of a philosophy into green or uh, say green field sites as well. Think about how the design and the development needs to grow organically to meet the needs of the, uh, the precinct that it, or the, the, the environment it finds itself within. And that way you know when, when the doors are open that it's a, it's a development that the media public will, will, have, uh, will be drawn to, that will, um, will have an, a vested interest in participating in. You want to create that, uh, that demand, you want to create that catalyst, so it needs to be really representative of the, the needs of that time and then also flexibly designed in order to change with the need of the environment as it, as it, uh, as it progresses. So uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge, certainly, uh, but I think a single phase is, uh, is often nice to have. Think about the phasing out, for, the phasing out of the development, think about flexibility of design, and um, that's where we can protect the, the investment, protect the scheme in the long term. But the selling point is lifestyle, as, as as lifestyle and convenience. And we know that it, it does vary from center to center. Paul, you've been involved quite a bit on, on a few developments throughout Africa. Are there any common factors that you see um, that come up again and again, which add to that lifestyle element? Because that is, to me, one of the main draw cards to you know either living or working or visiting on a regular basis a successful local node? Yeah, so if, if I were to use one term, I, I would say destination is, is what does the mixed use offer that creates a destination where people want to go and they, you want to make them stay there? So whether you live work or play with people from outside who live somewhere else, what brings them to, to that destination? Is it to work, to play, to live, and to do enough things um, in a secure environment? So you can use your time better, so I think that's one common um, thing. As, as, as metropolitan cities grow, especially in Africa, traffic increases, the, the environment suffers a little bit more, and people literally are buying convenience. And I think that's, that's one of the one, one things that mixed use um, development is a common thread in it. Um, I, suppose, I suppose for the use of the mixed use, it's about convenience. For the developer, it's probably more about the economic logic of it and making sure that you have enough 
and not people, not content out there to, to take the space that you have. So whether it's retail, or residential, commercial. But if it's a comfortable lifestyle, you know, people will come. People will come if, if, if it's a thing to do. You know, if it's a positive. No, absolutely, which is why, why I said uh, you need not just a catalyst, but you also need an anchor. You need something that drags a footfall, but you also need something from the developer point of view that drags the revenue. Um, because sometimes we do pretend that we want to create great lifestyles, but the bottom line is the economic logic has to make sense, otherwise the lifestyle will come to an end anyway at some point. So if I can just add to that, I think a lot of mixed use developments as well are focused around public spaces. Um, you know, they're not, they're not internalized mixed use developments, but they're open to the public and they've got public spaces and public access. And we're seeing it a lot with a lot of uh, global corporates as well. They, they're looking at, you know, they don't want to be necessarily in these big campuses where the employees are in and out of the building. And part of the employee value proposition is that they are, they have got amenities close by um, to do that and to interface with the public. And that's a big attraction as well. So one of the big aspects is to have a public square or piazza or something like that built into, into that, and then that brings, brings other challenges with it with regards to security and other aspects. Which is, again, your lifestyle aspect of it. I see we, we're running out of time, and it, it's quite critical for us to interact with you and, and open the, the forum to the floor for questions. But before we get onto that, I just want to go around the, the table, so to speak, and just um, highlight what developments you find are particularly successful, you know, in and around Africa, which could be used as a bit of a guideline going forward. If I can still start with your, with yourself, Simon. Yeah, thank you, Zina. Um, on a large scale, we've got um, ongoing projects such as uh, Tattoo City in Nairobi. You've got um, in Nigeria, in Lagos, you've got Echo Atlantic. Again, very large scale, uh, integrated all types of fuses. Um, what kind of sizes are we looking at, you know, as an optimal? Oh, <laughs> I don't want to be quoted on, on, on that. Um, it's millions of square meters of plants, uh, of so it's very large scale. Yeah. Um, yeah. Paul's development also. Yeah, Paul's going to mention it. <laughs> don't worry, I'll talk about Go for it, Paul. <laughs> so I, I suppose that you, you, you've already said that there, there are different ones there, but the whole concept of mixed use started from this, the high street. And then you have various uses that sprawl across the community. And then someone woke up one day and said, Can we put this in a vertical, in a vertical tower? Um, so, different mixed uses, I think, I think some successful mixed uses are the vertical, are the vertical mixed use. So, there is the landmark towers uh, where we, we have leisure, residential, a hotel, offices, and uh, retail all in the same tower. Major challenges, um, but, but I think by and large, a tower in Lagos, by the way, is 12 floors, not 25. But, um, um, but I, I think, yes, um, despite the, some of the challenges, it's been successful from both a revenue point of view and a lifestyle point of view. I like the VNA for many reasons. Although it's involved, it's not maybe a traditional mixed use, but it is a real destination and you can do most things in that um, area. Narrow's Arch, I love Narrow's Arch um, for, for some reasons. I only heard about some of the economic problems it may have had initially, um, but um, I like the idea behind it. I'm actually going tomorrow to to see how it's even a year, in, in about a year. Um, so they're quite, they're quite a few, and they're, they're, they're quite different from the sort of one acre mixed use sites to, to the 100 acre mixed use sites. Um, they all have different, different draw points. Okay, Mark, I'll answer you. Yes, um, I think I would agree as well. I think um, Melrose Arch is a good example of a, of a mixed use development that has managed to capture so many of the things that we talk about, the live work play. Uh, scenario. Um, interestingly, you know, having been rolled out over time, it is the product of a single development, which uh, well, was is, and, and is. Um, and it's nice to see something like it to get, uh, get real traction and gain the notoriety and the fame that it has. Um, and you know, while it's maybe not possible to put it under the umbrella of a single developer, you know, areas like like Rosebank. I mean, I'm, I'm going to name a few things because it's possible for us to walk out the door and go and have a look at them. Uh, but Rosebank is a nice idea because it's integrated. And I think it's a success of any mixed use development, the integration with its uh, urban context. You never really want to turn your back to it. You want to recognize the possibilities and opportunities that lie around, integrate them, and let the uh, mixed use development to become a catalyst in its own right, even broader um, uh, successes. Um, and um, I think. Uh, I think it's important to also touch on a framework because Tim mentioned earlier that, that some of the stuff he's involved in around Santon is phased and in some cases it's got different developers. So and not 
the developers don't always retain a common sort of um, framework to pull everyone together, which I think is one of the biggest challenges. And on the light of that, um, Tim, Thank your comments. Thanks, Henan. Yeah, so um, most of you will know the Stella Road precinct, which is the old mutual development opposite the Santon car train. It's 120,000 square meters of GLA, the entire development. And uh, since 2010, we've been, we've been working on that with Old Mutual. And one would have hoped, uh, my development manager is behind me here somewhere, but one would have hoped in, in uh, seven, eight years ago that we would have built out 120,000 squares in one phase. But market forces dictated otherwise. And we've had a phase of development like that. So it's five different buildings. And the real lesson learned out of there was that it was a mixed-use development on a, on a large super basement. Um, and different purchases and different developers that will come at different times to develop their bulk on that super basement. So lots of planning around how do you phase that. You know, the, the one, as an example, the one portion of land very close to Old Mutual's head office, it was determined from a risk point of view that they wanted to have an open piazza for temporary purposes while they were trading, waiting for the future development. So that whole portion of the basement was enabled to take a structure of 20 stories above it and designed in such a way with knockout panels and the like to accommodate certain designs in the future. Other areas, if you peer over the hoarding into that site, there's an eight level basement large hole on the corner because that couldn't be defined in terms of how to handle that. And then again, you're gonna have five different owners all sharing a super basement um, that needs to be managed. So the process of setting up those co-ownership agreements and the companies to manage those mixes and put all of those together is, is, is a process. <coughs> Uh, lots of lessons learned on that. And the interesting thing there, perhaps just to mention, is that it, they, the strategic decision was made to subdivide that site so that future purchasers could buy the property, do effectively whatever they wanted on that within the rights that they could obtain, and also later on do the construction that they would want to do later on. And not like a sectional title, as is the norm in South Africa, where you may have a, you know, you may have 100 apartments and an office building next door, which is sectionalized, and the office building wants to do something to it, they need to get approval from the body corporate and so get approval from the, uh, the grandmother on the 10th floor. So those aspects need to be thought about as well in, in terms of that. Absolutely. Okay, we have a roving mic. We, let's open up the questions to the floor. Any questions? Okay, gentlemen in the corner. If you could just introduce yourself as well um, prior to asking the questions and if possible, at who you would like to direct it. All right, my name is Mo Pala from ARC Architects. Um, this question is directed to anyone who wants to take it. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot about um, you know, mixed use, I hear about piazzas, I hear about access, but when I start to think about the South African context, how important is public transport? You know. In, in the States, mixed use is there. You pop out, you pop out on the subway anywhere at any, any time. I hear eight basements, you know what I mean? But, you know, public transport, I mean, now we see the how train, we see Uber's getting people around, people are traveling a lot. But in, when you guys develop your mixed use, how important is the public transport aspect? You know, do you perhaps, I'm gonna use a stupid example like Sun City. When you go to Sun City, you pop your car there, there's a tram that takes you there, there's a bus that takes you anywhere you go. For free of charge, so that's why people have this, you know, convenience is extra. In a mixed-use development, you go there, you park your car, basement eight, take the lift, and then, you know what I mean? So, from a development point of view. Um, I'll just touch on that, because um, that's, that's quite a, a pertinent point, but, you know, a fine line, and I'm sure Tim's going to touch on that now, because he's like itching away there, you know, for a mic. But, but you know, I find, as, as, as an architect, you, you find that your um, developers, who are often quite corporate, have certain targets that they've got to meet. And everyone will tell you around the table that you can't even think about leasing a top-end office building if you don't have at least five parking bays um, per 100 square meters. So those are some of the key elements that unfortunately do impact some of the commercial developments. But coming back to public transport, which is something we touched on yesterday, I see that the city of Johannesburg is making an active, with their corridors of freedom to do, to develop that, and they're relaxing a lot of zoning in some of the key areas, which is an initiative 
for people to 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 um, encompass those areas and, and try to grow them. And that's where we need a lot of the public-private sort of collaboration to really make it work. Because transport really is a something that that must be implemented by the state for developers to be able to work with. Tim, on your side, I know you wanted to comment. Oh, I, just okay, right in, uh, yeah. I think um, one of the attractions behind the idea of mixed use development is that it's a self-sustaining entity. Uh, it's very, uh, the, the intention between mixed use development is to make it uh, almost uh, infrastructure proof, so to speak. So you think about uh, uh, the African context where some areas are better serviced than others, some are better uh, transport uh, nodes than others. You look at a context, like, or you look at a project uh, of a mixed use to nature, you're looking at keeping people uh, or the live work, uh, play environment in the same locale. You're looking at uh, basically eroding the need for having to travel long distances and maybe even bypassing the shortfalls that might exist in public transport. So to create a self-sustaining environment is, uh, is where mixed use development has really kind of grown in terms of its, uh, its appeal. And um, I think it's, it's one, of the, one of the challenges in, the, in thinking about the continent at large because infrastructural availability is a, it's a random, well not a random, but it's a, it's a, it's a varying uh, scale. And some areas are better connected than others. So when thinking about mixed use precincts, you think about what can we do to make this precinct so sustainable in the sense that perhaps then the infrastructure that would support greater development near it might come later on, but at least you've got an engine that can run itself in the meantime. Thanks. Now that I've got my chance, I've forgotten what I wanted to say. No, I'm joking. No, look, you know, the, the one thing about, who would have thought 10 years ago, honestly, the guys who live in Joburg, who would have thought that there'd be such uh, the, the development potential around those car train stations would be what they are now. So the, the, the changes have taken place and, and the mindsets, there was no trust in the system. Uh, and the mindsets have changed over, over time. But not to make this too South African centric, I think the importance of public transport is massive. We see it in Lagos with the light rail. Already developers are looking at land around light rail stations because that's going to be then the distribution of, of people from certain areas. So it does have an impact. But I think, you know, one thing we're missing around the continent is the culture of the people. In Lagos, um, majority of people have drivers, they get dropped off, the drivers go and park somewhere, and it's less of a requirement. In South Africa, we are a culture of drivers. We like to drive, we like the control, and therefore, the tenants that are dictating the terms are dictating the fact that we need eight basements. But the culture will change, I think, Tim, because we, we drive ourselves because there isn't an alternate option. You know, you just look at the outcome of Uber nowadays, and that's changed people's outlooks enormously. Just, just that small thing, you know, the car train. We've got people who live on the East Train who have an extra spring on their step because they can drive and then catch a train into town. You know, so I think it is, it is, it is happening. There's a question here. Um, Sean Davy from Roma Park in Zambia. I just wanted to touch on what Marco said because he mentioned the importance of a marketing report. Um, to bring it kind of pan-African and maybe Paul has some experience in this, I obviously a marketing report is prudent for almost any property development. It's important to know what, what you need and what the market wants. And I think the mixed developments probably, it's even more prudent because you're across sectors. What I would like to understand is how, whether in a place where statistics and data is so difficult to come by, maybe, you know, I'm talking, you know, north of the Limpopo, whether those marketing reports really are the driving factors of what you do in those uh, mixed-use developments, or whether it's a box-ticking exercise. Well, I, su I suppose it's the cart and the horse, and, and we, we, we have this conversation, which one comes first, and I, I say it depends. Um, so there's a reason why you want the report. Some people want it because they need to show it to a bank. Um, so it could just literally be a bankable exercise to get finance. Um, some people need it just to inform the architects, give the architects a better brief. And some people need it for their own sort of personal um, satisfaction, you know, to, to validate the thoughts that they've had. So it really depends on what you needed and the nature of the report and, and how you go about getting it. Um, Ticket the box exercise, in some cases, yes. And I think most developers will tell you that when they go to the banks to, to seek finance and the banks say, where is the marketing report? Now that is a ticket the box exercise. You get your report written the way you expect the bank to want it rather than anything else. And that, that really, I suppose, is the truth. So I, I think you're certainly right there. But what I don't want to do is, is either invalidate or reduce the, the requirement for one. I think it's very important 
to hear from a third party who has spoken to several different developers, land owners, designers, and have their views as to what the market can take. Um, and mixed use developments are very complex when you build a new economic profile around it, the whole economic logic around it. They're, because A, you've touched it, they're phased, so some income comes later, some income comes earlier. When you're building there, invariably quite expensive because of the amount of infrastructure you have to build up front. Um, the market trends could be changing, the dynamics of people could be changing. I mean, who would have known 20 years ago that you literally don't have to go to work to be at work? Um, so, so effectively, yeah, you think, well, your leisure is on your, on your iPad, your work is on your laptop, and um, your retail is on your phone. Um, so you literally can sit on the beach and live, work, and play. Um, so, so there are many trends that are they're, they're changing things, and I think it's important to stay ahead of that curve all the time. Um, and I, that's why I think Mark's report has its uses. Um, but I think, Paul, on that, I think it's also your end user that gets a lot of comfort out of knowing that the due diligence has been done. I don't know if you want to just touch on that, Simon. Yes, so, so, you, so you touch base on the, on the opacity of uh, the real estate market in, uh, in Africa, which is a big uh, issue when uh, you are about to develop uh, a thousand square meter of whatever asset class you want to develop. Um, so, as, uh, as Marco said before, it all comes to market research. Uh, the due diligence you do on your site, on your market, the surrounding of your sites, understanding your competition with the existing stock, the future supply, what your competitors are, are planning to do. And, and to do that, there is no magic recipe. You need to do a very thorough um, research exercise. You need to do desktop research, you need to do field research, you literally need to walk around the streets of uh, the city you're looking at to understand the dynamics, to understand who, um, uh, who is your catchment area, who, who are the population living in the area, so what sort of, uh, of people are living there, what kind of income uh, they, they are on, uh, will they be your, uh, your future uh, purchaser for residential apartments, will they shop in your uh, retail uh, shopping mall, all that sort of thing. So it's, uh, it's not magical, it, it takes a lot of time, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a tough due, due diligence to, uh, uh, to do before you, you embark on the, on the, on the journey. Thank you. Uh, my name is Charles Napa. I'm from Kigali, Rwanda. I run a company called Century Real Estate. And we're involved in the mixed-use development Kigali Heights that won their award. Just one or two comments uh, on the market research. Um, I think Paul nailed it on flexibility. Because you usually find that from the time you do the market research up to the time the project actually breaks ground, there's uh, quite a number of dynamics that have changed. And uh, for people who are in businesses like ours, you don't want to be the guy who did the market research and the guy who is letting the property and eventually the guy who will manage it because by the time you're managing it, what you put in your report will no longer be uh, applicable. So it's a bit of a, of a, of a catch-22. The second thing I wanted to comment on really is that different markets really uh, differ. Uh, in Kigali City, we have... Uh, just to give an example, we have a city master plan that's very aggressive in terms of parking ratios. Um, at Kigali Heights, for example, we have one bay for about every 80 square meters. Would that make uh, international retail brands attracted to the building? Probably not. Would that mean that those who have taken the leap of faith and come into the building are not making money? Definitely not, they are making money. Uh, if you go, and that's going to be worse because the city is thinking about greening the city and more public transport and encouraging people to walk and cycle and what have you. Um, it has its own pluses, it has its own minuses, but the point is really that uh, you have uh, retailers and developers and even architects have to look at every market with its own uh, uh, peculiarities. Thanks. Well, I, mean, I think it comes back to something that we mentioned earlier. And, uh, you know, coming to a, a decision in terms of what, where do we need to put the brick, where do we need to build the column, very often these design decisions are a result of option analysis. Uh, so when planning uh, a scheme, you need to know that you've got a team around you that uh, can attack the problem flexibly, can simulate scenarios, and can think long term. And um, so when that brick goes into the ground, you want to make sure that it's 
done in such a way that it can serve one or two functions as opposed to just the one. So it's, uh, it's very much scenario planning and very much uh, equipping yourself for a flexible future. I, I agree with that scenario. So Charles, just to mention that I know Kigali City well, and I know their master plan very well. Um, and maybe just to bring up, there was a discussion earlier on master planning. Um, often the master plan planning is not based on development and market fundamentals. Um, and you may find that a certain area that a developer wants to develop a shopping center in is now in the master plan saying it's got to be a 25-story office building. So just a caution around master planning being fixed and allowing for flexibility on master planning okay. is critical. Is there any other laptop? You have another laptop, you uh, This question, I'm Frank Brookman, uh, SVA Architects. Uh, so questions for Paul, I think, but I reckon anyone around the table can uh, can answer because Tim has touched on it. I've been involved with the Nelson Data Square mixed use development for many years. So I'm aware of the complex co-ownership agreements, leases, sectional title that is in place for all the owners that are linked to that that development. So I was just wondering, outside of South Africa, because I hear there is there's no sectional title that can be utilised. How you look at co-ownership agreements in mixed use developments, especially where you have owners above one another. So from, from our platform, um, our we don't have other owners, owners. so he's, he's like, <laughs> yes, we're, we're one owner. Um, so from outside the residential, we're, we're the owner. Um, but but the, we do have the section title issues with the res, in the residential because um, A, you, do, you have to make it available for funding. So whoever buys it needs to be able to fund them. Um, so we use the lease system in, in Nigeria. Um, so you, you basically cut out the taxes from the leases. Um, so it's a little bit easier to manage. So just to add to that, uh, we're the project managers on the exchange in Ghana, as you know, Frank, and that's, uh, the pro I, I think they touted as the largest mixed-use development in West Africa at the moment that's under construction. Now, that's, that's very different to the sectional title, obviously, and it's got residential apartments. Uh, phase one is 50 apartments, 14,000 squares of retail with a pick-and-pay anchor and a Radisson Blue Hotel over one big super basement. So now you've got the ownership issues around that. So obviously, the, de the developer is a... Um, private equity fund that has a, a finite term in terms of the, so they're looking for the exit. So the planning around that has to take that into consideration as to how do you de develop the development and plan the development for exit at the end of the day, where you'll have 50 owners in the, in the residential, a, a retail component and then a hotel component, or, uh, but certainly the residential being separate and leasehold. It's leasehold, but with the, the right agreements uh, in terms of the co-ownership. And that's just horses for courses. You, you have to sit down, start it from scratch, look at your environment and where you're at and work it from there. Okay, we're running out of time, so let's have our last question. Uh, actually, just a quick contribution to that. Because, uh, we recently worked on a project um, in Lagos, and essentially the, the way they set it up was a shared transfer. So, so all, there, there's the head lease, uh, which is taken over the property, and all the people who want to buy into the property uh, board shares and uh, obviously that transfer takes place and I don't see a reason why you can't do that with other asset classes. There are some challenges to that, um, uh, especially in, in Nigeria. Uh, so there are advantages but there are challenges. One of the challenges is the banking system, they don't actually understand it. So that whole co-op system is not really understood uh, from a financial point of view. Um, and also uh, the integrity of it passing it down, as you know in West Africa where property is a very emotional investment that you expect your child and your grandchild but the people don't quite understand that whole movement of shares. So there's a big education that's required to make that more, um, because we looked at it and we thought it was ideal structurally, but not ideal from, from a, a, a knowledge point of view. In conclusion, um, you know, there's a definition that I've, I've been looking at, and it's, um, which I thought about as the introduction, but it serves better as a conclusion, you know. The success we've seen is, is basically putting together a set of adjacent and inter, interconnected facilities around a, a common centre, which helps to reduce uh, the distances between housing, work, workspace, retail businesses, um, it, and, and therefore limits destination travel. Um, it leads to more compact development, strong, neighbor, strong character of neighbourhood, and is um, very user friendly and pedestrian friendly, which um, at the end of the day gives you a better lifestyle. Thanks to the panel and thank you for attending our session.